Amen. If you've never been following Jesus, if you if you've just started into church, maybe this is your first Sunday. Uh, man, we're just so glad that you're here. Maybe it's your first time in a long time. Maybe you were raised in church. Maybe uh, you have a lot of history growing up that. Uh, was surrounded by church, and, and Easter Sunday has been kind of a habit for you, and so you decided to come here. We're so honored that you would join us um, this morning. We're so thankful. And uh, one of the things that, that I just want to do is I just want to remind you again of our, our mission statement, which is to help people experience a uh, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Ultimately, this morning is about Jesus, and it's about the fact that He is risen from the grave. He died on a cross, but He is alive today. Amen. Amen. And here at Bain Chapel, we really believe that that gospel message, it's the words that we use for it, the gospel, the good news, really is the best news that anyone could ever receive. That there was someone who was willing to die on a cross for you and for me, to pay for our sin, to pay for all of our regrets, all of our guilt, all of our shame. He took that on the cross for us and our behalf. We just think that's the greatest news ever. And it's not only that he paid for our sin and he died on the cross, but the Bible teaches that he rose again. And it's not just the Bible. I mean, think about the Christians years and years and years who have given their life for this story because they believe that it actually happened, that Jesus actually got up from the grave. And it really changed everything. And so what I've been doing here at our church uh, for the last couple weeks is I started a sermon series called Gospel Stories. Because, you know, I can talk about the cross and I can talk about the resurrection, but sometimes seeing the gospel, the good news, that's what gospel means, good news, sometimes seeing that message in a story helps us remember it and helps us see it in a fresh way. And so the last couple Sundays, I've shared a couple stories from the Old Testament that illustrate what Jesus did for all of us this morning when he died on the cross and when he rose again. And I... I'm thankful you came here. I think today's story is awesome. It is one of the coolest stories. And you're going to learn how to say a word today. It's going to be a really long word. So if you don't get anything for a sermon, at least you say, well, you know what? I learned a really big word today. It was so good that I was in church. But this is an amazing story of the gospel message. And it happens in the Old Testament. And it happens in the story of a man named King David. And if you've been raised in church, if you've been to church, been driving by a church, you've probably heard of David and Goliath, right? That was one of the things that made him super famous. He was one of Israel's greatest kings. But before David was king of Israel, of the Jewish people in the Old Testament, there was another king named King Saul. And King Saul was actually Israel's first king. Before that, the Israelites just had God and Moses as a mediator and and other Jewish leaders. But when they had King Saul, King Saul was like their first king. And, you know, he did pretty good. But eventually, King Saul disobeyed God and God said, all right, you're getting demoted. Like, this is not happening. You're you're not obeying my instructions. You're not following me. And and then what happens is God sends his prophet Samuel to anoint a, a, a really a young boy who is out in the, in the, in the pasture, and his name is David. That, that's how David learns that he's going to be becoming the next king of Israel. So the prophet anoints David. He's a little kid, and then eventually he begins to kind of grow up. God has his spirit on him, and, and he has just amazing like abilities and talents. Uh, eventually he finds himself at the battle where there's David and Goliath and the Israelites and the Philistines and that whole thing. God empowers David. He, he kills that giant Goliath like nine feet tall, which is amazing when you think about it. I mean, this dude was taller than Shaquille O'Neal and all the other people that we think of. David, you know, killed Goliath with a slingshot. It was an amazing, powerful guy. And as you can imagine, like killing Goliath got, you know, David tons of Twitter followers. You could just imagine that, like tons of Facebook friends. Like he was all over CNN. He was doing late shows with, with everybody. I mean, it was a big deal. And, and yet, even though David wasn't the king, there were people that started like, sh- you know, shouting and proclaiming his popularity. And the current king, King Saul, that I mentioned, Israel's first king, he began to get jealous. He got so jealous that he, he decided to kick David out. He, despite all that David had done with Goliath and saving the whole nation of Israel, he kicks him out of the, the royal court and then actually chases him to kill him because, you know, he just wants to, to take him out. So David, for years, according to one study... According to you know, for just years, he's, he's traveling, he's, he's running away, trying to escape Saul. 
And there's some interesting stories in, in, in the scriptures as David is running away from Saul, and yet David has a chance to even kill Saul at, at one point, but he spares his life. I mean, David knows that God has appointed him to be king. He's just waiting for that opportunity. And that opportunity eventually comes. And there's a battle in King Saul. He gets fatally wounded and decides to commit suicide, to fall on his sword and, and just let that go. Jonathan, Saul's son... He dies in battle as well. And there's some other events that take place. And then eventually, David becomes the king of Israel. Now, it was customary during this time in the Middle East, uh, if you became a king, you would want to make sure that the old king party, the, those that were related or whatever, you would want to make sure that you, know, you killed off all the relatives, that, to make sure that no one from the old dynasty, no one from the old empire would ever come back and challenge you as the new king. And you can imagine how David might have wanted to do this. I mean, David has been running from Saul. Saul has made David's life so difficult. And finally, Saul and Jonathan are dead. And you can imagine that King David would want to just eradicate any, you know, any residue or any remembrance of King Saul and his family. And this is where we find the story that we're about to read. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 9, as King David answers and utters this question and tries to find out, is there anybody left in the kingdom of Saul? This is 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul? To which people will remember, okay, David's finally king. You know, he, him and his family have now officially moved into the White House. They're wanting to get rid of everyone else. What are they going to do next? But listen to what David says next. This is really different the people in his time, that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, I mentioned Jonathan was one of King Saul's sons that died in battle and was not able to be king. But even though Jonathan should have been like the next in line to take the throne, Jonathan didn't side with Saul. He sided with David and actually developed a friendship with David. He developed a friendship so much that David promised that if he ever, you know, became powerful and, and became king, that he would, he would help Jonathan, he would kind of take care of Jonathan's family. So instead of David assuming the kingship and deciding to take everybody away and kill everybody off, he decides that because Jonathan, Saul's son, was so good to him, he's going to extend kindness to anybody left in the kingdom of Saul. So how do they find who's left in Saul's lineage. The Bible says this, now there was a servant, there was a servant of the house of Saul, he was left, and his name is Ziba. They called him to David, so there's a servant from Saul, and the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant, just want to let you know, I'm no longer Saul's servant, I know you're the new king, I'm wearing I love David t-shirt, I am now your servant, I'm all yours, okay? And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I might show kindness of God to him. Ziba's probably like, uh, kindness? Like, you, 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 you know, you're not going to go on some murder rampage? O okay, yeah. Um, I mean, this is a little strange, David, but there actually is. Uh, Ziba said to the king, there is a, still a son of Jonathan. Ziba said to the king, listen, he is crippled, though. He's crippled in his feet. Now, here's the big word that you're going to learn. The person that Ziba is talking about, and this is his name, Mephimosheth. All right, let's all say that on the count of three. One, two, three, Mephimosheth, right? So then when you walk out of here, if you say, don't learn anything else, you just say that. Just, just hey, how's Mephimosheth doing? That's just a fun word to say, right? If, if, if you get mad at somebody, Mephimosheth, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But that's, that's, a good, that's a good long word. I don't, you know, we're trying to pick out a name for, for our you know, son coming up. We probably won't go with something that long. But anyway, so, so what happens is, you know, Ziba says there's this guy, and his name is Mephimosheth, and he's actually Jonathan's son. Now, if you follow the history, what happens is when Mephimosheth was five years old, he was being taken care of by a nurse, and when the nurse heard that Saul, 
Mephibosheth's grandfather and Jonathan, his father, had been killed or had heard that they were going to be killed. What happened is the nurse ran away because she was like scared. She's like, you know, I can't let the grandson die too. So she runs away, but what happens is she actually drops Mephibosheth as a five-year-old. And apparently something happens to his legs in that whole scene, and he gets crippled from that point on. I mean, if you were Mephibosheth's nurse, think about how guilty like you feel. You're holding the grandson of the king, and because you lose your step and you trip, you cripple Saul's heir for life, and he can't ever serve in an army. He won't ever be a warrior. He's pretty much doomed for life. I mean, can you imagine Mephibosheth being in counseling and said, yeah, when I was five, my mom dropped me, and I was, no, literally, my mom dropped me, and like literally, and, and the nurse, the nurse dropped me, literally ruined my entire life. So this is the situation. This is the person that he's talking about. And the king, David, said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to him, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Emil, at Lodibar. All right, so that's where he is. He's kind of in this little place, and you can find him. So then King David sent and brought him the house of Maker, the son of Amimel, at Lodibar. And then this is what happens. Mephibosheth gets the invitation. He probably does not imagine that this is going to be a good scenario for him after all. He's the grandson of the king that just got defeated. And this is what happens when Mephibosheth shows back up to David. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David. And what did he do? He did what any of us would do in his particular situation. You probably feel like the new king did not like your dad or your grandfather because of all the stuff that happened. He did the only thing that he really could do. He fell right? He's crippled. I don't know if he was carried. I don't know if he had crutches, but whatever he does, he decides, I'm just going to lay it all out there. And he falls to his face and he pays homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, behold, I am, same thing as Iba said, I am your servant, (laughs) right? I'm yours. Like, forget my grandfather, forget all of that. That wasn't me. That happened a long time ago. Look, I've been crippled. There's no way that I'm going to take care of you or, you know, try to usurp the throne, try to take that away from you. That's not my story. And David said to him, do not fear. What? Do not, do not fear. What, what's going on, David? Aren't you, going to, aren't you going to kill him? I mean, he's part of the old regime and you've got to, you know, you've got to show people that you're the new sheriff in town. David says, no, 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 don't fear, Mephibosheth. Listen, listen, here's what I want to do. I want to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Mephibosheth, I'm not sure if you knew this or not, but me and Jonathan, your dad, we were really great friends. And I promised, and we made a pact together, that, that I would be for him. I would be on his team. And even though that whole thing happened, even though you're crippled, even though you know, I could just totally wipe out the remaining relatives of Saul... I want to show kindness for you. In fact, I'm not just going to show kindness to you. Uh, What I'm going to do, not only just am I not going to kill you, but I'm actually going to restore to you some things. I'm going to restore to you all of the land of Saul, your father. Mephibosheth, I don't know if you knew this, but, you know, I'm going to give you some land that you had. And not only that, but I'm going to do something even even bigger. And this, this is the big deal here, okay? I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you a seat at the table, and you shall eat at my table always. Now, listen to Mephibosheth's response to this. And he paid homage again. He just said, okay, and said, what? 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 Hold on. Time out, David. Time out. You brought me here not to kill me. You brought me here not to make fun of me, not to assert your authority. You brought me here. Now you're going to give me land, and, and now you're going to invite me to a seat at the table. I don't understand. What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog? That's what he calls himself, a dead dog such as I. And back in the Middle East, dogs were not cute. They were not in homes where everybody, you know, there was no Fluffy or Fido or things like that. Back in the day, like, dogs were just gross. They, they probably didn't have a lot of owners. They were scavengers. Um, you know, it was a derogatory term. It was the same way like pigs and stuff like that. Jewish people, dogs, pigs, they kept them in very low regard. And so Mephibosheth, as a crippled individual, he basically tells, he tells David, like, no, you don't understand. Like, I'm just worthless to you, David. I'm worthless. 
why in the world are you doing this? You're giving me this land. You want me to eat at the table. I mean, this is the same table where your children are going to eat. This is, this is the king's table. Why would you even care about that? But that's what David wanted to do, and it was really interesting. In the following verses, what happens is David gives commands to, to Ziba, and he tells him, okay, I want you to you know, set this up, and I want you to make sure that Mephibosheth gets here. And just so we know that David followed through on his promise, this is what it says in 2 Samuel verse 13. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. And just so we know how big of a deal this was, the Bible also includes this. Now, he was lame in both his feet. What an amazing story. A king who could have completely destroyed and hurt Mephibosheth and killed him, instead of wiping him out and making him feel guilty and making fun of him, instead of doing all that, David gave Mephibosheth a seat at the table. Amazing. Now... The reason why I think this is a gospel story is because really what Scripture teaches is that every story or or really every main idea in the Old Testament is really pointing to one person. It's pointing to Jesus. In fact, when you read the New Testament and you look over how Jesus treated people, Jesus loved people, how Jesus showed kindness to people, how Jesus saved the hurting and saved the lost, how Jesus invited people to the table. What you began to see is that Jesus actually lived like King David in the kind acts of giving love and forgiveness to the whole world. In, in fact, when Jesus died on the cross and he rose again, that was Jesus' way of giving us a seat at the table. In fact... Uh, an apostle of Jesus that, that came later, the Apostle Paul, I'm sure you've heard of him before, he actually wrote a letter where he began talking about this, this thing that God did through Christ on the cross with inviting us and forgiving us of our sin and giving us a seat at the table. Listen what, in, in, in the letter to the Ephesians, this is what the Apostle Paul writes. He tells his readers, you were dead in your trespasses. For those of us that remember this story of Mephibosheth, this is even worse. The Apostle Paul says, you weren't just crippled in your sin. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. What is trespasses? Trespasses is whenever you cross a line, whenever you break a law. And not just breaking the law was bad, but just the the wickedness and the evil within the human heart. This includes you. This includes me. The Apostle Paul says, listen, before you met Jesus, you were like dead in your sin. You had no hope. You had a sentence of death over your life because of everything that you had done in disobedience to God. But then the Apostle Paul says, but I want you to know what God did. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love which he has loved us. Okay, this is what God did. Even though we were sinful, even though we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ by grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wrap your mind around that. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again, He delivered this amazing invitation for you and me to have a seat at the table. Well, I'm not worthy. I struggle. I'm sinful. And it's amazing to me how some people have, and maybe this is your story, some people don't go to church. And the reason they don't go to church is because they feel like they're not good enough to go to church which is almost like sick people feeling like they're not well enough to go to the hospital. That just doesn't make any sense. If you're sick, you should be at the hospital. If you don't feel good enough to follow Jesus, church is exactly where you should be. Because we have a Heavenly Father who loved you so much that He sent His Son to give you and me a seat at the table. Well, what if I'm crippled? Well, so was Mephibosheth. But here's the interesting thing if you've thought about this story. When Mephibosheth was seated at the table, what was covered when he was seated at the table? His crippled feet. 
See, when he was at the table and he was sitting down, his, his like deformity or his injury was covered when he was at the table. And that's what Scripture teaches happens to us when we receive forgiveness from Jesus. His blood covers our sin. And when we are seated at the table of Jesus Christ, we don't focus on our shortcomings and our sin, but we focus on the grace of Jesus Christ. And just in case you missed it, this is what the uh, Apostle Paul says. He says, the reason that Jesus did all of this, the reason why God did this, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace toward us in Christ Jesus. So so this is what the Apostle Paul says. Just in case you missed it, the reason Jesus gave us a seat at the table, the reason Jesus is like King David and we are like Mephibosheth, the reason Jesus did this is so that for ages to come, people would look at our, look at us and go, wow, isn't it incredible what God has done for them despite what they have done to God? What amazing grace, what amazing mercy has been given out to us. Now, I'm not sure of your story, but I can testify that in my life, I have personally been like Mephibosheth. I was raised in church. My parents were both ministers, and and they, they taught me about God from a very early age, and I'm very, very thankful for that heritage. If you were here and you're a parent and you brought your children, way to go, because even though you might be struggling to live right or you might be struggling to follow Jesus, there's really no better place, I think, for your kids than to hear at a very early age that God loves them and he has a plan for their life and that he can forgive even their little sins and and get them into... It's amazing. So so way to go for doing that. And so I'm thankful for the heritage that I have. But as I began to grow older, especially in high school years, in my heart, although my body was in church, my mind was not. (laughs) Although my, my, you know, talents and my abilities and was singing that God gave me all the gifts or whatever he's done, although that was in church... And even at times I would preach and I would sing. Uh, My heart was really not there connected with Jesus. It was connected to other things. When I graduated high school, uh, I realized that really what I wanted to do in life uh, was date girls. That was pretty much my thoughts, right? I mean, it was maybe it was the dimples. I don't know, but I just decided like I'm gonna, I'm gonna just you know that that's what's that what makes me feel alive. That I'm gonna do that, and that led to relationship after relationship after relationship. See, whatever you're trying to do to fill that emptiness inside of you, whatever you try to do, you're basically using people and using things. And through relationships, I broke many people's you know, hearts, and they would cry, and then they would break my heart, and, and I would cry. In fact, it led to one time I had broken up, and, or the relationship had ended with a particular girl, and I was driving hours to see her to proclaim my undying love for her because I had heard that she had, you know, gotten interested in someone else. And basically when I showed up there and I was like, here I am, she rejected me. And I had to drive all the way back home. But on the trip back home, God began to deal with me. He began to use uh, uh, an audio book called Wild at Heart, which was basically finding our identity as men in Jesus. And as I was listening to that, I began to realize through that, that season of my life that really I, did, I had no idea who I was as a man. I was using relationships really to feel good about myself and to feel okay, to fit in, to feel like I was somebody. If I, if I dated a, a pretty girl and I had a relationship and I could, you know, if I had some trophy maybe that I could, you know, show off or whatever, then, then, then that way it made me feel good about myself. But deep down, I was, I was insecure. I was selfish. I was, I was a sinner. I was, I was leading a lifestyle of destruction. And if you had known me back then, you probably thought that I would have been conceited and selfish and and dangerous because I was all of those things but God. And that season of my life, 2006, while I was at college, kind of a little heart, you know, really heartbroken that that girl rejected me, but reaching out to God because I didn't feel like I had any other options, God met me. And he began to teach me that I didn't need anyone else to be okay, that, that I could receive forgiveness, I could receive His validation, I could receive God's purpose for my life, and, and He could make me whole. 
you know, and, and instead of relationships where I was like holding on to them like a life preserver and drowning them in the process, that God was going to build into me strength. He was going to build into me a character that would actually be able to later in life offer that to someone else. But even though I had sinned, even though I had messed up, even though I had turned my back on God, when I called out to God and I asked Him to forgive me of my sins and for the first time make me a man in His image, He gave me a seat at the table. Jesus gave me a seat at the table. And can I tell you this morning, if you're a visitor or maybe you're coming here often, today is a very special day and not just because not just because it's Easter and this is what we do in America. But I want you to know that people today have been praying for you. You're not here by accident. The people that invited you, we, we've done an entire invitation campaign at our church. And the reason why we've done this is because we, we want you to experience the same kind of forgiveness and love that Jesus has given us. As Jesus gave me a seat at the table, we want to let you know this morning, that Jesus would love to give you a seat at the table. And you say, well, Jordan, uh, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how many times I've dedicated my life to God. You don't know how many times I've messed up. Jordan, you don't even know what I did last night. You don't know what kind of addictions that I have. You don't understand that I could never live the Christian life. I can't be like you. I can't be like those that are at Bain Chapel. I just can't. I just can't live it. I know that, that I might be good at church and I might come, but you just don't understand. Well, can I tell you this? Because of Jesus, you have a seat at the table. And it really doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter what you've been involved in. It doesn't matter like what's happened to you and, and how things have gone. The story of Mephibosheth, my story, your story, is that God in Christ has given you a seat at the table. 